Welcome to our webinar, Another Reform Conversation, What Small Employers Should Know, presented by Priority Health. For those of you interested in the large employer impacts, watch for an upcoming webinar in spring 2013. What we found in discussions with employers and agents is that small employers are a bit behind in planning because they often do not have the robust legal and financial support that larger employers can harness. So we decided to focus there today. Now, a quick legal disclaimer before we begin our discussion. This presentation provides a general overview of certain aspects of health care reform based on information currently available. It does not cover all of the requirements, and new information is released frequently. Information provided by Priority Health about health care reform should not be considered legal advice. This is an educational tool only, and the effect of reform may differ depending on your circumstances. During today's discussion, we'll cover the following topics. First, we'll discuss the implementation activity at the state and federal levels in preparation for 2014. Second, we'll focus on the questions that are top of mind for small employers. What is a small employer? You may be surprised to realize how the federal government makes this determination. How will small groups buy coverage? What will small group coverage look like? What options will be available? And what do we know about the cost of coverage for 2014? Third, we'll share with you some notable provisions that apply to small employers. And finally, we'll bring it all home with a case study, tying all the pieces and parts together to help solidify the relevant topics in your mind. Okay, let's dive in. What's going on related to 2014 readiness? January 1, 2014 is just around the corner, and the flurry of activity has accelerated. We can expect the level of activity at the federal agencies overseeing reform, Health and Human Services, or HHS, the Department of Labor, and the IRS will significantly increase during summer and early fall. We heard recently that training of navigators, consumer assisters, and agents will be conducted in the summer. And don't forget that the new marketplaces, formerly called exchanges, will be ready for consumer shopping October 1, 2013. In about six months from today, 50 million consumers could begin shopping for coverage through these new marketplaces. So will everything be ready? Well, we're getting there. We just received our first sets of final regulation from the federal government. Everything released up to this point has been proposed regulation. They also published the minimum value calculator and a set of interim final regulations around the shop exchange. Interim final seems like an oxymoron. How can something be interim and final at the same time? Go figure. The end of February and 1st of March brought an onslaught of content, indicating that the administration is bound and determined to make 2014 a reality. The names of the new regulation may not seem to be relevant to you, but they are loaded with information about small group rating, benefit designs, and taxation provisions. The new guidance we've received in the past three weeks makes up more than 1,500 pages worth of new material. Some nice light reading for those of you looking for a good weekend novel. The federal government is trying to offer more assistance by scheduling calls with stakeholders, including issuers, to clarify the thousands of outstanding questions. So you could say we've only seen the tip of the iceberg. The federal government has committed to focusing on operations, including transactions with plans, establishing the data hub needed to run the exchange, and details on employer interactions. Plus, we know that additional sub-regulatory guidance is coming to help explain much, much more. In the absence of guidance, we are doing the best we can to prepare for 2014, even though much is still unknown. Now let's turn our attention to Michigan and see what's going on in our home state. In the wake of the election, and with the political currents settling, Governor Snyder resurrected the idea of a state-operated exchange. He tried to pass a bill in the House that would stand up a state-operated exchange in Michigan, but without success. Considering that not even 20 states have decided to stand up state-operated exchanges, 
Perhaps it's best to not be in the minority on this one. Most states aren't rushing to raise their hands because of the lack of guidance and condensed timelines. Michigan did, however, submit a blueprint application for a partnership exchange in Michigan, which HHS conditionally approved earlier this month. Under this model, the state will continue to own two functions. Plan management, meaning that the state will oversee all the products and rates sold in the state, and consumer assistance programs, for which the state received a grant in excess of $30 million from the federal government. We continue to interact with the state routinely since there are many decisions the federal government has deferred to states. For example, how to determine whether an employer is large or small in some cases, and who is eligible for coverage on the family plan. The Office of Insurance has been collaborative and thoughtful in designing the market in Michigan under the authority granted to them by the federal government. Here are some key milestones relating to 2014 readiness. Let's start with March. As promised, the federal government provided the final rules for some of the key financial provisions around reform. In May, carriers in Michigan must submit plans for small group and individual markets to the state for review and approval. The state does not have authority to approve without the Department of Health and Human Services review, so the state will pass rates and benefit forms to HHS in July. During the summer months, we'll also see the federal government focusing on consumer education through marketing and advertising campaigns. During August and September, HHS will notify carriers of the plans that have been approved. September is the first time that carriers and others in the market can see what plans and prices will be available to both small group and individual markets. October is when the exchange marketplace is open for business and when the initial annual election period begins. January 1 is when the reforms are effective for new policies and as the policy renews for existing plans. On to the next agenda topic. We'll cover the first of four questions that should be top of mind. What is a small employer? Health reform ushers in a new method for determining employer size. Employers with less than 50 employees are considered small, and those with 50 or more are large. But it's not that easy. How do you count to 50? Well, let's review. Under proposed regulation on what the Affordable Care Act calls employer shared responsibility, large employers are defined as 50 or more full-time equivalents. Notice it's not just full-time employees, but includes full-time equivalent employees. So how do you calculate if an employer is large? Add the full-time employees to the full-time equivalents to get the number. An employer needs to look at the last calendar year and do the math for each month. So look at January and count the number of full-time employees and full-time equivalents, then February, and so on. Transitional relief is offered in the first year for employers to use a six-month period instead of the full calendar year. The employer may choose which six-month period to use, but the months must be consecutive. Full-time means any employee that works 30 or more hours on average per week. To identify the full-time equivalents, the employer needs to sum the number of hours worked by all employees who are not full-time and divide by 120. Again, this must be done for every month in the prior calendar year. So get out your spreadsheet. Let's walk through an easy example. Employer XYZ has 30 employees who work 30 plus hours per week last month. This employer also employs 100 part-time employees who work 15 hours per week each. Collectively, the part-time employees worked 6,000 hours last month. By dividing the 6,000 hours by 120, we find that employer XYZ has 50 full-time equivalents. So 30 full-time employees plus 50 full-time equivalents means this employer has 80 employees and is a large employer. For those of you increasing staffing significantly for certain seasons, there are special rules for you. 
The seasonal employee exception indicates employers are not large if they exceed the 50 employee count for four months or fewer. When counting your full time equivalents, do not include more than 120 hours per month for each part time employee. This rule is meaningful for employers that have workers putting in lots of overtime during specified seasons. Essentially, the overtime is not included in the math. This calendar year test is to be performed annually to identify if the employer responsibility has changed. Why is it relevant to understand what size employer you are? Large employers have a responsibility to offer coverage to full-time employees and their dependents. If they do not, they may bear a penalty. So the flip side of this is that small employers, with less than 50 full-time and full-time equivalent employees, do not have a responsibility to offer coverage to their employees. There are no penalties, no responsibility under the health reform laws for small groups. Let's say this another way. Because this is the most frequently asked question we receive from agents and employers related to health reform. I am a small employer based on the counting method we just discussed. Do I have to determine who is full-time under the new 30-hour rule? And do I have a responsibility to offer them coverage? The answer is no. Small employers do not have a responsibility to offer full-time employees coverage. You are not at risk of paying penalties. Clearly, there are other reasons why small employers may want to continue to offer coverage for employee talent acquisition and retention, but penalties are not one of them. Can I divide my company into many small employers? and potentially avoid the shared responsibility requirement imposed upon large employers? Many creative ideas are floating around. This is definitely possible. But the initial draft guidance from HHS indicates that the employees of multiple corporations must be combined at the ownership level when determining employer. To quote from the HHS guidance on this, all employees of a controlled group or affiliated service group are to be taken into account. For more information on the IRS definition of controlled group, you can see Section 414M of the Internal Revenue Code. So, if the same owners run the many separate companies, you've achieved nothing with dividing the business. What is the definition of an employee? Again, for counting purposes, the health reform regulations refer to existing common law and definitions on this one. An employee is subject to the will and control of the employer. Under common law definition, leased employees are not considered to be an employee of the employer. Additionally, partners and shareholders are also not considered employees. Here's another question we receive from small employers often on this point. If I offer coverage to employees, can they buy coverage from the individual exchange? Yes. Here is the criteria for purchasing coverage from the individual exchange. You must be a U.S. citizen or legal alien. You must not be incarcerated. And you must be a resident of the state of Michigan in order to purchase from the Michigan exchange. However, individuals are not eligible for federal assistance to pay for premium and cost-sharing requirements if a qualified employer plan is available to the employee. So. What is a qualified employer plan? What is qualified coverage? Well, this is also known as minimum essential coverage. So let's talk about minimum essential coverage. What is this? There are two tests that apply here. The first tests how comprehensive the plan is, the minimum value test, and the second tests how affordable the plan is. By law, the plan must offer minimum value, which is defined as satisfying a 60% actuarial value test. This means that a plan would pay for at least 60% of medical expenses on average for a standard population. Small employers use the actuarial value calculator, or AV calculator. We'll talk about this more later. Every plan by law must satisfy the 60% value if it is to be sold in the small group market, so you won't have a problem here. Let's talk affordability. This test looks at each employee uniquely, 
not the aggregated population, to check for affordability. It compares what employees pay for coverage to each employee's wages. How this works is that the self only employee contribution for coverage for the lowest cost plan cannot exceed 9.5% of wages. If it does, the plan is not affordable and the employee can access federal financial help through the exchange. On to the second of our four questions. How will small groups buy coverage in 2014? The current mechanisms through which employers purchase coverage will still be available in 2014. Small employers can select a priority health plan similarly to how they do this today. Most employers access support of an independent agent. Priority Health believes that this support provided by our agent partners will be needed more than ever as employers journey into the changes that 2014 introduces. So you can still come to us and we'd love to have you. Nothing needs to change there. Additionally, the federal government is introducing a publicly run marketplace where employers can go and choose a benefit option again with the support of their agent partner. This federally operated exchange is called the SHOP, which stands for Small Business Health Options Program. There is a separate exchange where individuals will be able to go and purchase coverage. The feds have decided to rename the new federally run exchanges and call them marketplaces instead of exchanges. So the SHOP Marketplace, which will open for business October 1st, for January effective dates, is another place where small employers can select a benefit package. Let's talk more about how the shop will work and how it compares to today's process of purchasing a Priority Health product. You can decide for yourself whether the new shop marketplace is a place into which you'd like to venture. We expect to sell products there also. Is an application required? Yes, through both avenues. However, the draft exchange application was 21 pages long. We'll expect that the process won't be easy for employers to apply to access coverage through the shop marketplace. What does the employee enrollment process look like? The public exchange is a bit like a unicorn. We've heard a lot about it, but no one has seen one. We can't say for sure what the process will look like for employees to enroll in coverage. Are there participation guidelines? Yes, for the shop, 70% of the eligible employees must participate. This excludes employees eligible for Medicaid, Medicare, TRICARE, or another employer-sponsored plan. We don't know what the state will require for products sold outside of the shop. Michigan has to make some decisions there. Is there a contribution requirement? The shop does not have one. The Fed's reasoning is that employers will be motivated to participate in order to satisfy the participation requirement. We are in active discussions about what our contribution requirements will be, if we have them, based on the newly released information on the shop. What types of products will be available on the shop? Most carriers will offer a limited subset of the small group products on the shop while offering the full suite of options outside of the shop marketplace. How many products can an employer choose for employees? On the shop, the answer is one. This is a change from the original design proposed by HHS. Because of the reality of the implementation timeline, HHS has to cut the employee choice model from scope. Under employee choice, the employer would choose one metal tier, gold, bronze, silver, or platinum, and the employee could choose any plan or carrier combo from that metal tier. Additionally, the shop exchange was going to produce an aggregate bill from all carriers to make life easier on the employer. Well, this isn't going to be the case for 2014. The employee choice and aggregate billing model has been delayed until 2015. Outside of the shop marketplace, employers have the opportunity to offer two or more plans to employees. Additionally, Priority Health just announced that we will soon introduce a private exchange with iSelect, a custom benefits store that will allow four plan options to be offered to the employees within one small employer. Okay, what else do we need to know about the shop? Well, the shop is the only place where the small business tax credit can be accessed in 2014 and after. However, 
As many of you have probably experienced, most employers are not eligible for this tax credit. The GAO did a study finding that less than 20% of the expected employers have filed for this credit. In our research, we have found this is because most employers do not satisfy the average income or number of employee requirement. We'll talk about this credit more in a minute. What will it look like to interact with the shop once you've decided to purchase coverage there? The call center will be operated by public employees located in Baltimore, most likely, and the staff will be new to insurance and plan selection. Priority Health Support is based locally and operated by personnel with depth of experience and benefits. We're here to service our community. When can employers purchase coverage? At any time, employers can purchase a 12-month policy. Additionally, a new annual period requirement has been established. During this period, carriers are not allowed to impose the participation rules on employers. This period runs from November 15th through December 15th of every year. Our third question, what will coverage look like for small employers in 2014? All of the items we'll discuss in this next section apply to plans as they renew January 2014 and after. Additionally, grandfathered plans are exempt from all of these reforms. If you aren't certain whether or not you are grandfathered, you probably are not. Employers had to work really hard to keep their status since March 23, 2010 until now. The grandfathered rules require that employee cost share for medical services and employee contributions for premium cannot change materially since 2010 in order to maintain this status. We have a calculator that can help you understand if you are grandfathered. It is located at understandinghealthreform.com. Let's talk about essential health benefits. Beginning in 2014, all non-grandfathered health insurance coverage in the small group markets will be required to cover essential health benefits, which include items and services, in 10 statutory benefit categories. These services include benefits that most small employer plans cover today already, such as emergency services, preventive care, hospitalizations, and lab services. Each state had to choose a benchmark plan that would be used to define what every small group product will have to cover in the state. Priority Health's HMO plan was chosen as the benchmark in Michigan. Being the benchmark plan in Michigan means two things. First, all plans sold in the small group market must offer benefits that are equal to those covered by the benchmark. This includes limits on amount, duration, and scope of covered services. It does not include cost-sharing requirements, network, and utilization management. Second, all plans may have to offer the same number of drugs in each class or category as our HMO benchmark plan. There are a couple of other nuances worth noting on the topic of essential health benefits. All small group medical plans must cover pediatric dental and vision services. Pediatric is defined as including coverage for individuals under the age of 19. So in 2014, you'll see this mandated benefit added to your medical package. Plans cannot exclude an enrollee from an entire category of essential benefits. For example, the plan cannot deny maternity or newborn coverage to dependents. Again, a change to how your plan works today. One other interesting category is habilitative services. This is different from rehabilitative services. We do not cover these services today. Most plans in Michigan do not. And so we will have to cover new services under this category, including some of the services related to the treatment of autism. By law, all plans sold in the small group markets must have an annual limitation on cost sharing for essential health benefit services. It is designed to limit what the enrollee pays for deductibles, co-insurance, or co-payments for the policy year. It is a true out-of-pocket limit, meaning that enrollees will stop paying co-payments for all covered services, including prescription drugs, once that out-of-pocket maximum is met. This product design feature in many cases is an improvement in the plan benefit and may increase premium anywhere from 1 to 4% increase 
if other offsetting benefit changes are not made. The law places these limits at the same level as the out-of-pocket maximums that are in place for high deductible health plans or HSA compatible plans. For 2013, these amounts were $6,250 for single coverage and $12,500 for family coverage. Out-of-network services do not apply to this annual limit. The final rules reiterated that high deductibles must retire from the small group market. Deductibles cannot exceed $2,000 for self only and $4,000 for family. These amounts are expected to go up annually. There is an exception to this rule in one instance. If the plan cannot reasonably reach a given level of metal tier coverage without doing so, for example, if a plan is trying to reach a 60% coverage level, which is a bronze metal level, and cannot get to that level without increasing the deductible, then an increase above this deductible limit may be allowed. And that leads me to our next topic, the metal levels and actuarial value. The federal government has made an actuarial value, or AV calculator, for carriers to use to fit each plan design into a corresponding metal tier. AV is a measure of the percentage of expected health care costs a health plan will cover for a standard population and can be considered a general summary of health plan generosity. It's a uniform measurement tool that takes all the variations of plan copayments and deductibles and converts it to a percentage of coverage. It only measures essential health benefits covered at the in-network level. The tool is publicly available, so you can check it out if you are interested. The kicker here is that every plan has to fit exactly at a metal tier, exactly at 80% or 70%, for example. There is a 2% up or down wiggle room that we have, but we are finding most of our plans do not fit. What does this mean? All of the current small business plans will have to change upon renewal. The co-payments, deductibles, and co-insurance combination will have to be adjusted to fit within a metal tier. Let's review some examples that may help. Here is an example of two different plan designs that could both fit within the gold medal level, both reflecting 80% actuarial value within a 2% range. You'll notice they have slightly different co-payments and deductibles, while both achieve a gold medal status. On the other hand, the bottom of the screen shows a plan that does not fit into a metal tier and cannot be offered in 2014 upon renewal. This plan demonstrates an 85% actuarial value and must be modified to fit exactly within an AV level. As you can see, because of this, the variety of health plan options available to small employers will be reduced significantly. You'll still have options upon renewal, but not as many as you have today. The final question to consider, what will coverage cost for small employers? Health reform regulation has introduced new rating rules for small group plans effective upon renewal January 1, 2014 and after. Rating factors are used today in the market to allow carriers to increase price when the costs, based on age or geographic location, are higher. Let's review this diagram, starting with the bottom right quadrant, Plans are no longer allowed to rate based on industry codes, duration of coverage, health status, claims, experience, or gender. What can we rate on? Three things, age, location, or geographic factor, and tobacco use. Let's talk about each one. Age. HHS released a very prescriptive approach that offers little variation for states a uniform age curve will apply across the nation. All children through age 20 must be offered the same rate for the same plan regardless of age, and the rate is almost half the rate of the 21-year-old adult. For adults, the premium ratio will increase in one-year increments, if increasing at all. Five-year age bands are not allowed. For example, at age 21, the premium ratio will be 1 at age 46, it will be 1.5. There is a 3 to 1 age rating limitation that applies to adults, so the 64-year-old's rate cannot exceed three times the rate of the 21-year-old. 
Age factors and bans will be determined based on age at policy issuance and renewal so that increases are not introduced in the middle of the policy year. Next, geographic factor. The state can define geographic regions as the number of metropolitan statistical areas or MSAs in Michigan plus one. So the Office of Insurance in Michigan has indicated that there will most likely be 16 geographic regions in Michigan, 15 MSAs plus one. Tobacco factor. Issuers are allowed to increase rates by up to 50% for tobacco use. The feds have defined tobacco use as using any tobacco product at least four times per week on average within the last six months. Now, one interesting rule for small businesses on this topic of tobacco, HHS is requiring that insurance carriers give employees the opportunity to reduce the rating increase if that employee participates in a wellness program related to tobacco cessation. So these three factors are used to calculate a per member rate. This per member rate will apply to each person seeking coverage. This is a different concept to grasp for small employers, which are used to composite rates, where the insurer provides a single, couple, and family rate. Let's talk about this more. Under the reform rating rules for small employers, standard family tier rates are no longer allowed. To derive each family rate, the per member rate of each person in the family must be added together for each specific family rate. See the example at the bottom of the screen. Husband plus wife plus daughter plus son per member rates are added up together based on each family member's age and smoking status to come up with the total family rate. What this means is that each family rate will be different in most cases. Ah, one quick note. For those large families with four or more kids, they finally caught the break they've been looking for. This family will only pay for three children, not more. The regulations indicate that it's up to the employer to decide to blend the family rate into a per-person composite rate for the purposes of determining employee contribution levels. HHS also notes that the employer can choose to charge each employee their share of the associated factors. However, clearly this would conflict with HIPAA discrimination rules, since the older employees would pay more for coverage under this model, so even though HHS offers this as an option, the reality is it really isn't an option. What can you expect with these new rating methods? Well, there will be winners and losers. Employers receiving favorable industry code factors or with a younger population could see their costs increase under the new model. One thing we do know for sure that employers can expect in terms of the cost of coverage is more taxes and fees assessed by the federal government, and we will be the vehicle to collect them. Let's talk about what they are. The first one is Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Fee. We'll cover it in detail on the next slide. Second. The temporary reinsurance program runs for three years, starting January 1, 2014. All small group plans must contribute $5.25 per member covered under the plan every month. The money will be collected by HHS and used to fund a national reinsurance pool that will pay for high-cost claims in the individual market. So group plans will pay into the pool but won't benefit from the payments. Third, a small risk adjustment fee will be assessed on all small group plans to support the administrative costs of running risk adjustment models annually. The money will go to HHS. Fourth and largest is the taxation on health insurance providers. This fee will be assessed beginning in January and will cost roughly 3 to 4 percent of premium. This will be collected by carriers and paid to the federal government annually. The total cost for these four taxes adds on roughly $7 to $18 per member per month on top of the premium costs. Additionally, an exchange fee of 3.5% of premium will be assessed on all plans sold through the shop marketplace. Unfortunately, the price of this fee must be spread across the market, requiring that health plans sold outside of the shop pitch in and share the load because the volume of business running through the shop exchange is a bit unknown at this point, 
it's hard to factor this into a per member per month equivalent. Let me talk a bit more about the patient-centered outcomes fee. This is also known as the Comparative Effectiveness Research Fee. The fee is designed to fund comparative clinical effectiveness research specifically related to patient-centered outcomes. Simply, it's a tax on all fully funded and self-funded employer plans. The amount is minimal, $1 per member per year in the first year and $2 in the second year, and then increased by medical inflation after that. To which plans is it applied? To those plans with the policy year ending after September 30, 2012. The fee is temporary and goes away in 2019. Insurers and self-funded employers must file this on an excise tax return by July 31st of each year, immediately following the calendar year to which the fee applies. The first time by which this must be filed is July 31st, 2013, this year. The IRS provides three to four different ways for determining the number of lives to count for the payment calculation. The final regulations have been released, and unfortunately, HHS has determined that a fee should be collected on health reimbursement arrangements, even if the HRA is coupled with a medical plan. In essence, a fee could be paid twice for the same person. Priority Health will pay a fee for the fully insured medical plan, and the employer must pay a fee for the self-funded HRA plan. So if you have an HRA, you'll need to file this excise tax return and pay the fee accordingly. Priority Health will be supporting our employers during this process. We'll provide more information soon related to the specifics. On the flip side of the coin, the small business tax credit could help employers with the increased premium costs. Unfortunately, this nice tax credit sounds great up front, but offers little to no benefit to most employers. Eligible employers can claim a 35% tax credit for premiums paid by the employer for employee coverage. The maximum credit goes up to 50% of premiums paid in 2014 and 2015, only if coverage is purchased through the shop. So which employers are eligible? Well, this is when the disappointment sets in. If the employer has 25 or more employees, the employer is not eligible. Additionally, the average pay cannot exceed $50,000. In fact, the full credit is only available for employers with less than 11 employees, making on average $25,000. The credit declines steeply after that point, diminishing completely at the 25 employee and $50,000 pay mark. For those of you that are eligible for this tax credit, we highly recommend that you use our tax credit calculator tool located at understandinghealthreform.com. If you can access this credit, by all means, go get it. Small employers can use all the help they can get to stay in the game. Our third agenda topic. There are a couple of notable provisions that apply to small employers. We'll review them based on their effective dates, so we'll talk about the ones on the near horizon first. The exchange notification requirement was delayed from March 2013 to later this summer. The Affordable Care Act requires employers to notify their employees of the existence of health benefits exchanges. The original act required the notification be issued by March 1, 2013. Information released last month postpones the requirement likely until late summer or fall 2013. The written notification must inform the employee of the existence of the exchanges, including a description of the services provided by the exchanges, the manner in which the employee may contact the exchanges to request assistance, the availability of premium tax credit to the employee if the employer's plan doesn't cover 60% of services and the employee purchases coverage through the exchanges, and that the employee may lose the employer contribution, if any, toward the cost of health benefits if the employee purchases coverage through the exchanges. The Department of Labor is considering providing model, generic language that could be used to satisfy the notice requirement. Alternately, the government may make a template available on the exchanges which employers could download, complete, and issue to employees. So stay tuned on this one. You'll need to provide this notice to your employees. We'll let you know when the model is out and provide you with support along the way. 
The shared responsibility rules contained a provision that allows employers to amend their cafeteria plan in order to permit employees to change their salary reduction mid-plan year due to the new reform provisions. Why would an employee want to change their reduction? To disenroll in the employer plan in order to purchase coverage through the exchange and to enroll in the employer coverage in order to avoid the individual mandate penalties. The Department of Labor recently released proposed regulation on waiting periods. These regulations propose that a group health plan and a health insurance issuer offering group health insurance coverage not apply any waiting period that exceeds 90 days. Nothing new here. The same information was issued in notices over the summer. The regulations clarify that the waiting period would continue to be defined as the period that must pass before coverage for an employee or dependent who is otherwise eligible to enroll under the terms of a group health plan can become effective. However, the 90-day waiting period limitation generally does not require the plan sponsor to offer coverage to any particular employee or class of employees, including, for example, part-time employees. Instead, these proposed regulations would prohibit requiring otherwise eligible participants and beneficiaries to wait more than 90 days before coverage is effective. The Department of Labor indicated that due to the clear text of the statute, the waiting period may not extend beyond 90 days and all calendar days are counted beginning on the enrollment date, including weekends and holidays. If, with respect to a plan or issuer imposing a 90-day waiting period, the 91st day is a weekend or holiday, the plan or issuer may choose to permit coverage to be effective earlier than the 91st day for administrative convenience. However, a plan or issuer may not make the effective date of coverage later than the 91st day. The Affordable Care Act calls for a prohibition on discrimination in favor of highly compensated individuals. The law points out that non-discrimination rules are in place today for self-funded plans, but fully insured plans have been exempt. Not for long. We haven't seen regulations on this one but HHS has said they are coming this year. Grandfathered plans are exempt from this provision. Coming soon, employers will be required to submit employee rosters, pay information, and coverage options to the federal government to allow for future automation of the exchange operations. We don't know fully how that will work and are waiting on regulation from HHS. In the meantime, Employers should expect active and frequent interactions with the exchange to attest to information related to employees trying to seek subsidies. Why? Because remember that individuals are only eligible for subsidies if they do not have qualified employer coverage, coverage that is affordable and satisfies the minimum value test. Our final agenda topic. Let's bring this all together with a case study. For this scenario, the employer is a local landscaping company that employs 30 office staff, including management, landscape design architects, and specialty installers. During the months of June through September, this company brings in a significant volume of seasonal labor. The benefits are only offered to the 30 office staff workers today. The plan offered today renews March 2014. During the 2013 renewal, this employer retained their plan that features a $3,000 single and $6,000 family deductible with 80% coinsurance after deductible for all services. The employer funds a health reimbursement arrangement to help employees pay for deductible costs. The current waiting period for new staff is 120 days following the first day of the month after hire date. The top management at the company is offered a 100% plan with small deductible and a waiting period for this plan does not apply. Let's walk this employer through our four key questions. First, is this employer small or large? Let's count up the number of full-time and full-time equivalent employees. Remember that in the first year, employers do not need to use a full calendar month to determine employer size we are allowed to use a six consecutive month period. There are 30 full-time employees for the six month period. There are 150 full-time equivalent employees. 
I know this from adding the hours of the seasonal workers and dividing by 120. The total for each month is reflected at the bottom. What is the average count for the six-month period? 105. So, it would seem that this employer is large. However, we haven't considered whether the seasonal exemption applies. Does this employer exceed 50 for four months or less? Yes, the employer exceeds 50 for only three months. In this case, the employer is small, and the large employer's shared responsibility rules do not apply. Before the March 2014 renewal, there are key dates the employer should keep in mind. In April, small employers should consider whether they are eligible for the small business tax credit. In this case, our landscaping company exceeds 25 employees and is not eligible. Because of this, the shop marketplace doesn't seem like a good fit for the employer since there are more options available through accessing Priority Health directly with the support of an independent agent. July 2013 brings the first filing deadline for the excise tax return. This form must be filed by the 31st of July by the landscaping company to pay the patient-centered outcomes research fee. The fee is $1 for each member enrolled in the health reimbursement arrangement plan. Priority Health will pay the fee on behalf of the employer for the fully funded membership. In the late summer or early fall, our landscaping company must provide an exchange notice to all employees notifying them that the new marketplace will be open for individual consumers to shop for coverage and that federal subsidies are available through this vehicle. Finally, out of curiosity, this employer checks out the shop marketplace to see what all the buzz is about since it just opened, but decides to take no further action at this point, too complicated and too uncertain. In January, there are three things our landscaping company must watch for and consider even though the employer does not renew their plan until March of 2014. First, the employer will notice additional taxes and fees added to the premium bill for new health reform tax revisions. The employer will be assessed for two of the four new tax items, the reinsurance payment and the 3 to 4% tax on health insurance providers. These will most likely be called out as separate line items because guidance on the specifics of these taxes was not provided in advance of the 2013 renewal for carriers to build them into the premium rates. Second, the employer may want to amend the cafeteria plan, allowing employees to start and stop participation in the plan in January for two reasons. If employees have opted out of coverage and now want to join in order to avoid the individual mandate penalty, and if employees want to opt out of the employer plan in order to purchase coverage through the individual marketplace. Third, because we haven't seen regulation yet, we don't know for sure what the reporting requirements will look like, but our landscaping company should expect to comply with new reporting obligations by first of next year. Our second question, what will coverage look like? This employer's deductible must be reduced. The 3,000 single and 6,000 family deductible plan is no longer allowed under reform, even though it is paired with an HRA. Additionally, this plan does not have a true out-of-pocket maximum today where the deductible co-payments and co-insurance track to one single bucket. Simply adding this benefit feature would increase the cost of the plan without making some offsetting benefit changes. The actuarial value calculator shows that this plan does not fit right within a specific metal tier and can no longer be offered as it is to the employer. But don't worry too much about these details. Priority Health will help small employers crosswalk from their current plan into a new list of offerings. The employer chooses a product from the smaller menu of options and renews the benefit package. What will coverage cost at renewal? Well. This employer currently receives rating credit for a favorable industry code which is no longer allowed. Plus, because the average age of the employees are younger than most employers, this employer has benefited from the old rating model which allowed more significant discounts for younger employees. These two factors alone, without consideration of the benefit adjustments, will lead to an increase in price for the employer. Now, we can't tell you specifics of how much quite yet, 
but we do want to point out directionally where the rates will go for this employer. On the other hand, for groups that have unfavorable SIC codes and older populations, they could see favorable outcomes of the new model. There will be winners and losers under the new approach. Back to our case study. This group will see two additional taxation components added to the rate upon renewal in 2014. The Risk Adjustment Administrative Fee and Exchange Fees must be collected by Priority Health and passed on to HHS. Let me point out that even though this employer decided not to purchase products through the shop marketplace, the law requires that plans sold off the shop must share in the cost for those sold on the shop. This is why a new fee will be assessed here. Two final items to consider at renewal. The employer must modify the waiting period to not exceed 90 days. 90 days is 90 days, according to the Department of Labor. 90 days after the first of the month following hire date is too long. Also, because this group offers a better benefit package to the highly compensated, the group does not renew the 100% plan in 2014. Don't let the details here overwhelm you. We are simply trying to provide an awareness of how the pieces fit together. You'll have time to prepare and we'll give you the tools necessary to be ready. Some of you may be thinking, this is getting way too confusing and offering benefits is too much hassle. Let's talk about that thought quickly before we wrap up today. What would it look like for this employer to drop coverage, get out of benefits, and let employees fend for themselves on the individual marketplace? For easy math, we've assumed the average cost of benefits is right at $15,000 per family annually. The employer pays $10,000 and the employee must pay $5,000 annually. This example assumes that the cost of family coverage is right at the national average, $15,000 per year. The employer could drop coverage and remember that small employers are exempt from the employer responsibility, so penalties do not apply. However, you'll notice a steep increase to the employee cost of coverage. Why is that? Remember that the employee will have to access family coverage from the individual market, which could cost about 30% more than employer-sponsored coverage. Without a subsidy, the employee could see a price tag of $18,000 for coverage which must be paid with after-tax dollars, adding another 17% of cost. Why not tax-free? You cannot run individual policies sold on the exchange through a cafeteria plan and take advantage of tax-free premium. If the employer doesn't offer benefits and employees have to pay over $21,000 annually for family coverage, do you think the employees won't look for other opportunities? especially the higher compensated employees that will not get federal subsidies to help pay for coverage. Benefits are second in priority only to pay when employees are considering employment options. Small employers still have to compete with larger companies, often for finding and retaining talented staff. Let's say our landscape company does decide to drop coverage, but realizes that employee wages will need to increase due to the reduction in this valued benefit. What will it cost to gross up the employee pay in order to make employees whole for the first year of dropped coverage? Because coverage is more expensive in the individual market and this employer does not want the employee to feel that increase, the employer liability goes up significantly. In order to make employees whole, this employer will pay over 50% more than the cost of maintaining the plan they have today. Also, don't forget that increasing wages introduces tax impacts to both the employer and the employee. Workers' compensation, payroll taxes, income taxes, etc. Food for thought as you journey into the next year and start planning for renewal. We're here to help. Visit our website, understandinghealthreform.com. Sign up for alerts. We'll be launching a new version of the website in April 2013 and will provide a Reform Advisor tool that will help you navigate through reform. Remember, you can always send health reform questions to askpriorityhealth at priorityhealth.com. Thank you for listening to another Reform Conversation presented by Priority Health.